Okay, so this brings us to the last tutorial on Croc 1 2015 booklet. Croc 1 2015 booklet. So let's begin. So an experiment was aimed was aimed at testing flexor flexor reflex in a spinal frog which was initiated by simultaneous simulation with isolated pre threshold electrical impulse pre threshold electrical impulse now the frequency of those impulses was such that the reflex occurred what process in the nerve centers can be observed during this experiment during this experiment so basically what it means is that they want to check if the frog can do a reflex action flexing action okay now whilst doing that they initiate what we call a, a stimulation or a stimulus they did a stimulus but they did two things okay First of all, they initiated a stimulus and also they did what we call an isolated pre threshold electrical impulse. So these are the things that they did to one particular uh, 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 frog to check for the, uh, the flexing of that frog. And now they are saying that the frequency of those impulses, that means those two impulses was such that the reflex occurred. What it means is that the flexor reflex happened when they uh, simultaneously they stimulated this uh, how do you call it this frog and the question now is what process in the nerve centers can be observed can be observed during this experiment so that is what the question is all about and over here we are going to be talking about a summation Submission, submission. So then definitely, definitely when we talk about submission, that means you are doing two things at the same time to give an effect. Two things at the same time to give what an effect. And when we talk about summation, it includes both spatial and temporal submission. Both temporal and uh, spatial what uh, submission. So again. It's when you are doing two things at the same time to give an effect. To give an effect. So, of course, we are having both what? The spatial and we have both, uh, and we have what? The temporal uh, sort of what? Uh, submission. However, 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 when we talk about uh, uh, a spatial formation, I mean, summation, we are talking about what? multiple simultaneous input. Multiple simultaneous input. When I say multiple, it means multiple. That means a lot of what? Uh, stimulus occurring at the same time. That is what we call what? a spatial submission. Then we have what we call the temporal uh, submission. The temporal submission, which basically deals with what? a repeated input a repeated input a repeated input a repeated input or something that's occurring maybe twice or something like that that is them as what a temporal submission so in our question what we have what two stimulus occurring at the same time we can describe this as what as a temporal submission however if there were to be multiple uh, stimulations Occurring simultaneously, guys. What are you going to think about? Anyone? Multiple stimulation, spatial, exactly, exactly, spatial submission. So I believe this question is kind of clear. So over here we're having what C as our answer. Um, no, please. Um, you said two stimulus. I I I can't seem to see which stimulus is at two. Okay. Are two. Good. So now, first of all, I will get time and then explain all of this to you. But look at it. Now we are having a stimulation, okay, of the, how do you call it? The frog. 
we are stimulating the frog for a reflex what action. You know, in other words, for a flexor sort of what action. That is what we are looking for over here. And over here, we are having what they said the initiated simultaneous what simulation with isolated mm -hmm. uh, pre threshold electrical impulses. Mm -hmm. Pre threshold electrical impulses. Yes. If they were to be more than two or three or four, they would categorically state that we are having what to call what multiple impulses. I listen to me. Okay. Now we're having an isolated. That means more or less like two different kind of what pre threshold electrical impulse. And we are stimulating both of them simultaneously. And we are saying that frequency of those impulses has summed up together to give us what? A reflex. I understand me. To give us mm -hmm. a reflex. The good thing that what process in the centers can be observed. And again, we are saying that when we talk about uh, multiple, we are dealing with what? Spatial. And we'll talk about something like two things happening at the same time, in the same way, like, I mean, in this case, we have what? An isolated pre-threshold electrical what? impulse. Like I said, if it is multiple, categorically, they would let you know. And that's what over here, regardless, we are still going to go in forward for the temporal submission. Temporal submission. All right. So now we have a patient who was diagnosed with acute dysentery. Acute dysentery has been treated for three days in an infectious disease hospital. In an infectious disease hospital. On admission, there were complaints of high temperature, stomach ache, fluid uh, excrements with mucus as often as eight to 10 times a, a day. Before that, what's another name for acute dysentery? Who can tell me? Another name for acute dysentery is called what? Have you guys heard of shigellosis? Acute dysentery simply means shigellosis or shigellosis. It simply means shigellosis. Now, there's, now that's not the question. But the question now is that what sample should be taken for analysis? What sample should be taken for analysis? And of course, you want to analyze the what? There's two to check for the presence of this what? Shigella. The organism that causes acute dysentery is what? Shigella. And Shigella, you can find it in the stool. And that's what over here, your best answer should be what? Should be feces. Should be feces or stool. Or stool. Feces or stool. So we have an 18-year-old woman who has body disproportion, body disproportion, wing-like folds on the skin of her neck, underdeveloped ovaries, nuclei of her buccal epithelium, cells have no bar bodies, no bar bodies. Guys, when they say no bar bodies, what will be the genotype of this woman? Who can tell me? No. Come again. Come again. Total syndrome. I can't hear you. XO. Good. Uh huh. I didn't hear you guys. So the answer is what? XO. XO. Because there's no bar body. No bar body. But as a female, you must have one active and one inactive, isn't it? One active and then one at least bar body also what? Being present. But over here, there is no bar body being present. Present and that means that the genotype word XO. And what is the name for having a genotype of what XO? And of course, you are thinking of what Tena syndrome. Tena syndrome. Tena syndrome. Clanifeta, you already know XXY. Patao, trust me what? Patao is Patao is what? Trust me what? 13. 13. Edward. Oh, 18. Edward. 18. Uh, how do you call it? Uh, Down syndrome is what? 
21. Down syndrome, 21. Aha. Uh-huh. 23 chromosome will be the X and Y. Don't forget that. Because we have 22 autosomal chromosomes and we have one pair of what? Sex chromosome. Where we can have the XX or the XY. Aha. Uh-huh. All right. So over here, you're looking at what? Tana syndrome. Tana syndrome. Tana. All right. A 27-year-old patient with injury to the neck has lost approximately 30% of the blood volume. Lost 30%. The patient's condition is quite severe. Blood temperature is 60-40. 60-40. When we say blood temperature is 60-40, what is it indicative of? Who can tell me? It's indicative of what? Of shock. 60-40. It means the blood pressure is very low. It's falling. Heart rate is 140 per minute. Respiratory rate is 30 per minute. And the person is what? Conscious. Characterize the condition of the patient's circulatory system. Now look at the history. The history is that this person has lost what? Blood. 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 That should tell you that the volume of blood has reduced by 30%. And if the volume of blood has reduced by 30%, what should be your diagnosis? Of course, you are thinking of what? Hypovolemic shock. Of course, we also have a cardiogenic shock, which is a shock that is generated due to a problem with the heart. Hence, cardiogenic. Cardiac. Cardiogenic. Uh-huh. But we have what? Hypo volemic shock. That means fluid in the blood is going out. And over here, they say 30% of the blood volume is gone. So that is the mechanism of action. So over here, we're having what? E as your answer or as our answer. A soldier was, a soldier with explosion caused trauma. Explosion caused trauma was delivered to a hospital. That means an explosion which has led to trauma was delivered to a hospital. Examination revealed his tympanic membrane to be intact. Tympanic membrane to be intact. What defense reflex prevented the tympanic membrane from rupturing? From rupturing. From rupturing. So this one you need to know what is inside the ear that is serving as a protective mechanism, as a protective mechanism. And of course, the kind of reflex, we call it a tympanic reflex. It's just, it just like me bringing my hand towards your eyes. You see, involuntarily, your, 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 your eyes begin to close, isn't it? Because my hands are coming straight. Because that is the way that the eyes is conditioned to protect us or to, put, to prevent harmful substances from entering into the eye. The same way, the ear also have that sort of what reflex. And I've realized that sometimes when you put your earpiece in your ear, you connect it to your, your how do you call it, your, your device. Sometimes, sometimes, if unconsciously, the volume is very high, you hear that at once, the moment you just press your play, it will just sound like crazy in your ear. Then you want to just remove your earpiece, then now put it back, then it will now relax. That is more or less called a reflex action. A reflex action. So we have to call it a tympanic reflex action. And this is just an attenuation reflex characterized by an involuntary contraction of the tensor tympani. The tensor tympani and the stapedius muscles, stapedius muscles in response to a loud noise. So when this reflex is uh, generated, what it happens is that it activates or it contracts the tensor tympani, the tensor tympani and the stapedius muscles. It contracts it, it contracts it, it contracts it. So that's what happened. So looking at our option, what should be your best answer? Of course, we're not talking about relaxation. No, we are talking about contraction. So first of all, just move to what? 
Things that contraction. deals with contraction. Exactly. So you hear your answer should definitely be what? Be E. Contraction of the tensor tympanic muscles. The tensor tympanic muscles. And of course, the stapedius what? Muscles. But over here, the root relaxation, which means that it is wrong. But if they are brought contraction, of course, it could have also been what? Be correct. Stapedius. This should be you. All right. So over here, we are looking at E as our answer. A person with a fourth blood group, that means blood group what? A, B, blood group A, B. I know we have discussed extensively under biology on blood groups, has in erythrocyte both antigen A controlled by an allele A and antigen B controlled by what? Allele what? B, of course. What it means is that A, B contains what? A, and then what? B. Black group A and black group B combined together is from what? The A, B, which we all know that. Now, what it means is that now, in black group O, in black group A, O, who can tell me what will be the final black group? Black group A, O. What will be the final black group? We'll discuss this. Anyone? Anyone? A. a. Black group A. Why? For Sina, why? For Sina, why? Don't forget that black group A, black group O, the O gene, sorry, the O allele is recessive. Don't forget that it is recessive, so it will not show its dominance in the presence of what? Of A. The same way B, O. Which black group will show? Of course, black group B. Why? Because B is dominant over O. But when we have O, O as your black group, what will show? Of course, black group O, because both of them are recessive, so they will show. In the same way, in black group A, B, while we are seeing A and B together, it means that A is showing its dominance and B is also what? Showing its dominance. So that means that we have what to call what? Co-dominance. Co-dominance. So the question is, this phenomenon is an example of what gene interaction? So the gene interaction here is what? Co-dominance. 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 Why? Because A is dominating, B is dominating. So we have what? A, B. No one's about each other. But in A, O, A is dominating. So we say it's A. Uh-huh. So please take note of that. So over here, your answer is what? co Dominance, co dominance. All right. During narcosis, a patient develops a risk of cerebral edema, meaning uh, swellings perhaps in the brain. What drug should be administered in this case? One, we have what? Cerebral edema, cerebral edema. So you want to give uh, a diuretic, of course, that is going to force fluid out immediately. And we've talked about this. So what force diuretic can you think of? Who can tell me? Furosemide. Exactly. That is exactly. So your answer is what? Furosemide or furosemide. As simple as ABCD. As simple as ABCD. During surgery performed in abdominal cavity, a surgeon located ligament of the liver that is stretching from the anterior abdominal wall that is around your navel to the inferior surface of the liver. The question is, what ligament is it? So again, you need to get to know your, what's your anatomy. So again, Faustina, help us with that anatomical what, uh, ligament. So over here, the, the, the ligament that will stretch from the anterior abdominal wall to the inferior surface of the liver, of course, we are referring to the round ligament of the liver. The round ligament of the liver. Again, these things, you need to have what? Uh, a picture to help you to see them. Okay. But over here, we don't have such picture. But over here, I have a round ligament. So please, if you are not on the Telegram page, do well to be there. Because Dr. Faustina will do justice to that. She has been doing very well. All right. So here, round ligament. 
A nine-year-old boy has acute onset of disease, acute onset. Sore throat, body temperature, 39.5. On the second day, diffuse skin rash. Diffuse skin rash is present all over the body except for the nasolabial triangle. On examination of the oral cavity, crimson tank. That is flaming pharynx. And they have what necrotic tonsillitis is present. What disease is it likely to be caused? Or is it what disease is it? And of course, you should be looking at for what, for what we call a scarlet fever. A scarlet fever. Why? This should give you a clue. This crimson tongue. This crimson tongue. That's flaming pharynx. Very, 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 very red. As if it's on fire. So we call it flaming pharynx. And of course, the, tonsil, uh, the tonsils too are undergoing what? Necrosis. So necrotic tonsillitis. Necrotic tonsillitis. All right. So over here, I have what? D to be our answer. D to be our Don't go and go for diphtheria. And diphtheria, you know how it is characterized. They will tell you that it is difficult to actually what? Remove Aha, uh -huh. they will tell you something like that. So guys, take note of that. All right. A 49 year old man complains of pain in his metatas metatasopharyngeal joint and joint deformation. In the blood, we have what? Hyperuricemia can be observed. Guys, even before going through it, Anytime we are having too much of uric acid in the blood, what is the term called? Gout. Oh, exactly, gout. So even before you go further, you already have your differential diagnosis in your head or your provisional diagnosis in your head. So just go, go on to just, you know, confirm. And again, the x-ray is revealing that what? The joint spacing is narrow. There's erosion, Per articular calcification of the bone joint, osteoporosis. Then microscopy revealed inflammatory granulomatous reactions surrounding the nucleotizing masses in the area of the first uh, metatosopharyngeal joint. Guys, your answer is definitely what? It's uh, gout. 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 Granulomas, I know of. At the beginning of the presentation of, uh, is it Patmov? Yes. We talk about what granulomas, the different types of what granulomas that you need to be looking at for. Now, there are granulomas containing lymphocyte and macrophages were detected during the analysis of skin biopsy material. Among macrophages, there are large cells with fat inclusions, which contain microorganisms in spherical packages. Guys, they've given you the cells. Verkov cells, Verkov cells. What comes to mind? Anything they talk about Verkov cell? Who can tell me? We talk about these things. What comes leprosy. to mind? Leprosy. Leprosy. Exactly. You are thinking of what? Leprosy. If they tell you something about uh, mucolic cells, what comes to mind? Mucolic cells. Rhinoscleroma comes to your mind. If they think about guma cells, what comes to mind? Syphilis. <laughs> so if you understand all these granomatous diseases, guy, you will not worry yourself. So over here, simply put, your answer is what? Leprosy. Leprosy. A patient with suspected necrosis of the upper abdominal cavity organs was delivered to a surgical department. This condition is associated with acute circulatory disturbance of which vessel? Again, there is necrosis of the upper abdominal cavity, of course, and so therefore was not in the surgical department. Now, this condition is associated with acute circulatory disturbance of the following vessel. In other words, we are going to be looking for the vessels that supply the upper abdominal cavity. The vessel that supplies this upper abdominal cavity. Isn't it? And 
of course, we are looking at the celiac artery, the celiac artery or the celiac trunk. This is the only major artery that nourishes the abdominal digestive organs. But it does not have a vein. You know, almost every, every artery has its own veins where it drains into. But this doesn't have a vein. Or it doesn't have a named, let me put it that way, it doesn't have a named vein. Aha. Uh -huh. So over here, we are looking at what? At the colic trunk or the colic artery. Again, Dr. Uh, Faustina, help us with yes, the uh, colic artery. The colic artery. Sorry, the celiac artery. Celiac trunk, yeah. So over here, we're looking at what? At, sorry, this is E, not D. This is E, not D, E, not D. All right. Name the drug that inhibits excretory function of the pancreas during treatment of acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis. Again, what drug is used for chronic pancreatitis? Who can tell me? Chronic pancreatitis. pancreatitis. Exactly. Then for acute, you do what? You use contracol. For acute, you use what? Contracol. We've done this in pharmacology. Pharmacology. So this is not, you know, anything big deal. So, of course, so what it means is that if this person was under treatment, it means that by all means, the person was being given what? A contracol. Contracal or contracol, however you want to pronounce it. So your answer here is what? Is B. Your answer here is B because acute in chronic, it will be pancreatitis. Sorry, pancreatine. Pancreatine. All right. Of course, it has to call a protease inhibitors. This enzyme, it has to, sorry, this drug, it has to call a protease, or it performed by inhibiting proteases. Uh huh. An 18-year-old patient has developed candidiasis after the case of pneumonia. After the case of pneumonia. Candidiasis. What type of microorganism causes candidiasis? Is it bacteria? Is it a virus? Is it uh, whatever? What causes it? Candidiasis. Oh. What type of infection fungi. is come again? Fungi. Exactly. This is what a fungal infection. A fungal infection. So now let's continue. This person has developed what? A fungal infection called candidiasis after getting pneumonia and was treated with what beta lactam antibiotics. And of course, you know the beta lactam antibiotics was used for the treatment of what the pneumonia. So the question now is that what antimycotic agent should be prescribed? What antimycotic agent should be prescribed? In other words, which of the following is uh, antifungal drug? And your answer is what? Fluconazole. 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 As simple as A, B, C, D. Fluconazole. Antifungal also means anti mycotic antifungal antimycotic that's why i ask you what is the cause of agent for candidiasis during autopsy of a nine year old girl nine month old girl's body who died due to severe pneumonia complicated with sepsis so the person died of what pneumonia complicated with a sepsis lack guys look Lack of the thymus is observed. Now, before I continue, what is the function of the thymus? Who can tell me? What goes into the thymus? Why it is important? Oh, we've talked about this before. Can you guys remember the, the, the lymphocytes? That is where they mature. And you know, lymphocyte helps us to fight against what diseases because they form part of the uh, the immune system, isn't it? They help us to fight against diseases. So imagine, now the reason why this uh, girl, yeah, nine-year-old girl, 
even die with God, there was nothing to fight it. There were no cells to fight against the, uh, the pneumonia. No immune system to fight it. Lack of thymus is observed. Now, in the lymph nodes, the lymphoid follicles and the cortical substances are absent. Follicles of the spleen are reduced in size with no light zones and plasma cells. You know plasma cells? Well, we have that differentiation to where we get the uh, immunoglobulins. And these all fight against what diseases. Now, this is absent. All of these are absent. So what is the cause of such structural changes? And of course, you should be looking at what we call it, a thymus agenesis. Thymus agenesis. At this age, the thymus should have grown. The thymus should have grown to about 13.3 grams. And don't forget the thymus as you grow a strength. That's what we have what we call the involution. When you grow, it shrinks. Uh -huh. But unit is even big. 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 So it's supposed to have about 13.3 about grams. So for it to be, for it not to be observed, it means that it wasn't what coming. It wasn't forthcoming. So we have what we call it timers, a genesis. Is not growing, absence of growth. A patient with femoral neck fracture, femoral neck fracture, okay, who for a long time had to remain in bed in a false position has developed a dark brown lesion along the backbone. Imagine you are lying down flat for most part of. <laughs> Maybe you're weak, lying down. You're not moving an inch because you are bedridden, isn't it? You're not moving. So the question is that the patient developed what we call a dark brown lesion along the backbone. Definitely the person was lying supine, even here. They've studied you. That means lying on the backbone. Uh -huh. Soft tissues are swollen. In these areas of maceration, there is a foul-smelling liquid named the clinic pathogenic type of necrosis. So what type of necrosis are we talking about? And of course, without even taking too much of medicine, this is what? Bed sore. This is bed sore. Why? Because you are applying too much pressure on your back. And for that reason, because of the pressure, a lot of things move to that area or that tissue becomes what? Injured. And when it becomes injured, and again, because you are putting too much pressure, blood is not flowing to those areas. And when blood are not flowing to those areas, they begin to undergo the call what necrosis, necrosis, necrosis. That is why people who are bedridden, periodically we have to be turning them to lie on their left, turn them to lie on their right, so that everything will be what? Will be well balanced. Everything will be well balanced. Balance. So over here, we are looking at a bed saw. Bed saw. A woman poisoned with unknown substance, unknown substance, was hospitalized in a toxicological department. What group of drugs can be administered to decrease? So guys, over here, the question is not what, what anti- uh, how do you say, how do you say antitoxins that we should give? The question here is what? What drug can be given to decrease the absorption? To decrease the absorption. And of course, the introduction of the poison to the body or to her body. So for every organ, of course, you will have something that helps it to what? I mean, when you're injecting some poisonous substances, of course, your immune or your body begins to take in the bad substance and that is what leads to its intoxication. But now, we don't know the exact drug so we can't give the antidote to it. However, we can give a drug that can decrease the absorption or it can decrease the intake of this harmful substance. And of course, even the name itself should tell you the answer of, of, the, of what you're looking for. So the drug is called what? Adsorbent, adsorbent, adsorbent. 
That's all. As simple as ABCD. As zombie. And have you heard of charcoal before? Yes. Charcoal is one of what as open that you can be thinking about. Charcoal. 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 Some of you know it. I mean, many of you know it. Unless, of course, you've not stayed in the village or something. Anyways. A patient after disrupted cerebral circulation, disrupted cerebral circulation has developed paralysis. Choose the anti-cholinesterase uh, anti drug. Anti-cholinesterase drug. That is, in other words, a drug that will inhibit acetylcholinesterase. A drug that will inhibit acetylcholinesterase. And of course, you are looking at what? Prozerin. 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 And that's over here. Your answer is B. Prozerin. A 50-year-old woman is being treated for shingles in a uh, neurology unit. What reactivated virus cause this disease. In other words, what is the causative agent for shingles? That is what it simply means. What is the causative agent for shingles? For shingles. And of course, you are thinking of what? Zoster virus. A Zoster virus. Zoster virus. So basically, your answer is what? It's a Zosta virus. And that's why your answer is what? Uh, it's A. It's A. It's A. During examination of a patient, a doctor should use anatomical divisions of anterior abdominal walls. I've drawn this thing like a dozen times. Into regions for more precise diagnosis. How many such regions can abdomen be divided into? Who can tell me? We've done this one like a dozen times. Come again? Nine. Exactly. So you do it this way, isn't it? Then you divide it that way. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And every single area tells you the organs that you are likely to find. Those of you who have been following Medent on Instagram, I posted one of these things and the organs you can locate under each region, under each region. So when they say uh, there's a problem with uh, right lower iliac area, where it comes to mind? Which region comes to mind? Right lower iliac. Seven. The seven. So what organs can be found? Mention two organs that you can find at this area. Secum and appendix. Secum and appendix. So you see, so if you understand this, it helps you with diagnosis. It helps you with diagnosis. And that's what you guys need to understand. So if you start talking about area number one, you start talking about your, your, your liver and, and cool. Uh-huh. All right. Today is not the time for that. So over here, we are looking at what? At nine regions. Nine regions. Nine regions. All right. 